Hello, I'm Kevin Fernando, a GP partner at North Berwick Health Centre near Edinburgh and also Education Director of GP Notebook Education. Welcome to our new GP Notebook podcast, a bite-sized regular chat for all of us working in primary care. Podcasts will cover clinical tips and hacks as well as hot topics to help make our lives a wee bit easier, but ultimately to help improve the lives of our patients in primary care. Today, we will be covering the interpretation and management of abnormal liver blood tests in primary care. So we saw Eric in surgery a few days ago. He's 52 years old and he presented with general malaise. No past medical history of note. His BMI is 33. He's on no current medication, either prescribed or over the counter. He works in IT, he's a non-smoker and he tells you he drinks alcohol just socially. So you ran the gauntlet and you checked some bloods and it came back with the bane of our doc man inboxes, those mildly abnormal liver function tests that we don't know exactly what to do with. So I just take repeat four weeks and hope for the best. Slightly elevated ALT at 62, slightly elevated AST at 63, a normal alkaline phosphatase, a slightly elevated gamma GT at 65 and a normal bilirubin. Bloods also re revealed a dyslipidemia with a slightly high total cholesterol, a higher triglycerides and a lower HDL cholesterol. And HbA1c returned at 42 millimoles per mole or 6% um, in old money. So what is the likely cause of his abnormal liver blood tests? Is this possibly viral hepatitis, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, alcoholic liver disease, autoimmune liver disease, are you worried about something a wee bit more serious, hepatocellular carcinoma? And what is our next step with respect to his liver function tests? Would we reinforce that all-important lifestyle advice, weight loss, revisit his alcohol consumption? Would you refer to our GI or hepatology colleagues? Would you arrange a routine liver ultrasound? Would you check an ELF blood test? Or would you simply repeat those LFTs in four weeks' time? So here we're going to talk about the management of abnormal liver function tests in primary care and also the management of NAFLD. And the key re references here are the forgotten NICE NAFLD guideline published during 2016, NG49. The British Society of Gastroenterology have produced a very helpful algorithm on the management and interpretation of abnormal liver blood tests. And also, the BMJ published a very helpful rational testing article during 2018 as well. And they all remind us, well, mortality from cardiovascular disease, from respiratory disease, um, from cancers, fallen over the last 30 to 40 years. Mortality from liver disease has risen fourfold since the 1970s, mainly driven by alcohol misuse, chronic viral hepatitis, and increasingly obesity and a metabolic syndrome leading to NAFLD. And of course, if detected early, we have some clinical interventions, but mainly lifestyle change that may slow or even halt progression of liver disease. And that is where the role of LFTs is pivotal to help risk stratify those individuals at highest risk of progressive liver disease. The challenge, of course, for us in primary care is that mildly abnormal LFTs are very common in primary care. And as we all know, that degree of abnormality doesn't always correlate with disease severity. Liver disease is often silent until quite advanced. And as we know, LFTs are often checked for unexplained or non-specific symptoms. They're often checked really as an indicator of well-being, aren't they? But what we do know is actually one in five of people will have abnormal LFTs and most of these individuals will not have underlying significant liver disease. There was this really helpful study called the Ballot Study published uh, about five or six years ago now that looked at nearly 1,300 people from primary care. So a study very generalizable to the patients me and you see on a day-to-day -day basis. So these patients were found to have abnormal LFTs, but were not known to have underlying pathological liver disease. And what they found in this cohort of 1,300 people was actually only 32 people with abnormal LFTs had a specific pathological disease of the liver. 
And unsurprisingly, a large amount of them, 40% of this whole cohort, had changes of fatty liver on ultrasound, that hyperechoic appearance we often uh, see reported. And what about malignancies? Of course, that's what we don't want to miss. That's often why we check LFTs. Only eight malignancies were found in this cohort of 1,300 people. And what about my Docman strategy of simply rechecking the LFTs uh, every four weeks? They did this for two years. They checked the LFTs every month for two years and found this was an ineffective strategy. LFTs just remained persistently abnormal. So the authors concluded that we in primary care should be more proactive about determining an underlying cause of abnormal LFTs earlier on rather than simply repeating blood tests. They did find some useful stuff for us, though, in primary care. They found that the ALT and ALP were most associated with significant liver disease. And they mirrored what we knew about gamma GT. Largely not helpful, a very high false positive rate, and uh, again, very sensitive to alcohol intake. So the authors concluded it's worthwhile as in primary care having a heuristic, an algorithm, an aid memoir at hand to help identify those individuals with potentially modifiable liver disease. So here are some top tips on interpreting abnormal liver blood tests in primary care. So let's start with ALT. ALT is predominantly liver specific. And I remember that because there's an L in ALT. And it is a sensitive indicator of liver injury. For example, viral hepatitis, hep B, hep C, and also drug overdose such as paracetamol overdose. AST, on the other hand, is not as liver specific, but is a most sensitive marker of liver injury, particularly alcohol related injury. Another useful tip here is there's an association between an elevated AST and renal uh, carcinoma. So if you do see an isolated elevated AST, it's well worth maybe dipsticking the urine or looking a wee bit harder, perhaps with ultrasound, for any underlying renal lesion. What about the gamma GT then? Is there actually a useful role for the gamma GT? What they've done helpfully uh, in, in my area is remove gamma GT from the routine liver panel because it is difficult to interpret, isn't it? It's raised by a number of factors, alcohol, obesity, and several drugs, including statins and antibiotics. However, where gamma GT is useful is in two scenarios. First of all, it's the best predictor of mortality in those with established liver disease. So if you say have someone with established alcoholic liver disease with a high gamma GT, that's a poor prognostic sign. The second useful role of gamma GT is alongside alkaline phosphatase. So we know alkaline phosphatase is found in the liver. It's one of the key biliary tract enzymes but it's also found in a bone and also in the placenta, which is why if we see bloods from a pregnant lady, the ALKFOS is normally higher than normal. So if we do see a raised ALKFOS, it is actually worth checking the gamma GT because if you have a high ALKFOS but a normal gamma GT, then think bone and check things like calcium levels, bone biochemistry. However, if you have a high ALKFOS, and a high gamma GT, then think liver and go down a targeted liver screen route. So a nice rule of thumb there. So what about bilirubin then? Well, if we see an isolated raised bilirubin, this is often due to Gilbert syndrome, which is an autosomal dominant condition. So it will occur in every generation. And this is where you get a, a mildly elevated bilirubin secondary to any sort of physiological duress. For example, a viral illness. Patients are often mildly jaundiced, but it does just spontaneously resolve. But just be aware, an isolated raised bilirubin can sometimes be due to hemolysis. So just be alert to signs or symptoms of, to, of avert or occult bleeding. And if you are aware or worried about hemolysis, checking things like a reticulocyte count or an LGH can be helpful. And finally, clotting and platelets. If we do see abnormal clotting, a high APTT or low platelets, this of course is not a good sign. This is often an indicator of quite advanced liver disease. And more often than not, these individuals should be known to our secondary care colleagues.
So the BSG, the British Society of Gastroenterology, have produced a very helpful document on the interpretation and management of abnormal liver blood tests. And within that document is a very useful algorithm to help guide onward investigation if you do find abnormal blood tests. Well worth downloading. It's available from www.bsg.org.uk. So to conclude this podcast, I'm going to very briefly talk about the diagnosis and management of NAFLD, which is now the commonest liver disease in the Western world. NAFLD spans a spectrum of progressive pathological liver changes. The earliest, the most benign manifestation is hepatic steatosis, where the fat content of the liver exceeds 5%. What we want to avoid is the more inflammatory stage, steatohepatitis or NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, because this is associated with fibrosis, cirrhosis, and even hepatocellular carcinoma. So ideally, the NICE NAFL guidelines suggest we undertake an ELF blood test for those with NAFLD and a fibro scan for all heavy drinkers. So over 50 units weekly for men and over 35 units weekly for women. The problem is neither of these tests are routinely available in primary care. So what can we do in the absence of either of these tests? Well, the BSG recommends use of the NAFLD fibrosis score, www.nafldscore.com. This is essentially like a Q-risk score, but for your liver. What we are using locally and many other areas too is the AST-ALT ratio. This can be helpful too. If that AST-ALT ratio is less than one, that suggests NAFLD with a low risk of progression to NASH. If the ratio is over one, that suggests more serious liver disease and a higher risk of progression. And if the ratio is over two, that's strongly suggestive of alcoholic liver disease. And for those who are at high risk of advanced fibrosis, so those with a ratio of over one, nice BSG do suggest we consider hepatology referral. So what can we do in primary care for those at risk of advanced fibrosis? Well, we should assess their cardiovascular risk, check their Q-risk 3 score, and consider a statin. There's no reason not to start a statin in someone with NAFLD unless, unless their LFTs are three times the upper limit of normal. Actively manage any coexisting diabetes, hypertension, and alcohol excess. There are no current drugs that reduce progression of NAFL, but we do have emerging evidence for some diabetes drugs, actually, pioglitazone, GLP-1 receptor agonists, and also the SGLT2 inhibitors. We need to strongly encourage and facilitate weight loss where possible, and we need to reassess the risk after at least two to five years, depending on individual circumstances, and consider referral to our hepatology colleagues if that ASTLT ratio rises above one, if LFTs rise three times the upper limit of normal, if there are any symptoms or signs of progressive liver disease, or any features of atypical disease, perhaps an alternative underlying diagnosis such as hemochromatosis. So going back to Eric, what we should we do for Eric? Well, in my area, we don't have easy access to a fibro scan or to ELF. So I would assess his AST-ALT ratio. And actually, I was quite surprised to see that his ratio was just above one. So that does put him at a slightly increased risk of uh, progressive liver disease. So I should perhaps consider, by no means mandatory, consider a referral to our hepatology colleagues. So thank you for listening all. I hope you found this podcast helpful. Please make sure to subscribe to our podcasts, which are available on all major platforms. Get in touch via social media if you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future podcasts. You should also visit us at gpnotebookeducation.com to notch up some CPD points, register for our GP Notebook Clinic events, and download free resources and shortcuts to make our lives a wee bit easier, but ultimately to help improve the lives of our patients in primary care. The topic of our next podcast will be obstructive sleep apnea in children, and I look forward to speaking to you then. Mm -hmm.